Dobar dan i dobro došli na današnji seminar koji je u toku ispitnog roka, kada je hvala da se dobite. Naš gost je jedino zemljstvo, pa ćemo da preći na Englesi. It is a real joy to see you finally here. Harald Rolfsson, professor from Iceland. Some of you know him from a conference in Zadar in Ikam in 2005. And now at last you're here. There are two addresses associated, at least official addresses associated with Harald. Uh, one is uh, Reykjavik, another one is uh, uh, Bergen, both universities. Uh, some of you know Bergen is the oldest official department of meteorology in the world. The second one is, is uh, Uppsala, Sweden, and so on. You probably never know why Innsbruck didn't get that chance, but I guess because of internal world in, in Austria. Here we'll go much longer in, in past. What I'm talking about is like 150 years ago, Professor Harold Olafsson will talk uh, uh, several hundred years backwards. Um, Harold Burg got his uh, PhD with Professor Philippe Bouchot in Toulouse in approximately the same time as Joan Bouchard, right? And Joan was our visitor last week, so, so Toulouse is passing by to Zagreb uh, rapidly. Uh, one of the main contributions in science, what uh, Harald Burg has done, is on the nonlinear airflows over mountains, working with uh, Bouchot and then with the famous uh, Julian Hunt, JCR Hunt, and, and many others. Uh, and I could now go on, go on, but I'll let you say something, perhaps, about uh, uh, Leif Erikson, or I don't know if you'll come in the story. Thank you, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I must thank you for a moment, Carmen, for initiating this visit. Uh, it was initiated during the ICAM meeting at, uh, in Slovenia. Of course, uh, uh, ICAM will never be the same after Usada, which was uh, absolutely a unique conference in all aspects. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I uh, shall be giving you want to talk on some old aspects of mythology uh, that I've got from old documents. Now, uh, I believe that the talk will be recorded, so uh, I will put on a filter. I usually say some nasty things in, in about people that are not present. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, I'll put on a filter. Please remind me if I forget that this is being recorded. Now, this is being recorded. <laughs> I learned when I was in Toulouse that uh, you could find out who was throwing stones during demonstrations by, by filming the demonstrations. And then I asked one of the guys who was involved why people were throwing stones in front of the cameras. And he immediately responded, uh, they forget within five minutes that there are cameras there. Uh, I, uh, maybe I won't forget. I split my, my talk in three parts. First of all, I'll talk about thermally driven flows, major scale flows, coast. And then I'll, I'll have a short section on uh, downslope flows, or flows. And uh, the third part will be on synoptic scale air masses and uh, how America was discovered through knowledge of insolity or, to a more exact, uh, the lack of knowledge of insolity during the last stage of this discovery. Now, <clears throat> when uh, we seek an explanation for uh, the, the breeze coming from the land to the sea during the night. And we look into the textbooks, we find this. We find sea breeze during the day and circulation like this, and then usually the same page, we have the inverse circulation during the night. 
And uh, you will find this in textbook on the internet and um, even in a recent uh, series of papers in, in the weather. Now, the general weather. Now, <coughs> um, we, we have text associated. This comes from the Norwegian Weather Service. I, I literally took it, from, took it from there because there are, I'll be discussing the, this, the breeze from the lands of the sea in Norway. Uh, they even have this for sloping land and uh, colors. You know exactly how to interpret the colors uh, if, if there's some cooling in the descending parts uh, here or if, the water, if, if it's, it's warming up as it ascends. If that's the case, that's uh, even interesting pictology. Now, <coughs> we uh, we get text like this, uh, the land pools below that of the Asian Sea, surface temperature, the pressure of the water all over the water will be lower than over land, and this sets up a sea breeze, a land breeze in the night. Okay. Uh, this is what our <coughs> children are being taught at school. If we go back to uh, the 13th century, we have, we have quite a lot of old documents sagas. Uh, there was a substantial group of people in, mainly in Iceland, that really loved writing uh, history. Um, to what extent the history is true or not is, is maybe not relevant in this context, but uh, <coughs> we have a pile of these, tens and tens documents, and they are relatively well preserved. This is, we even have a picture of one of the guys who did it. This is a picture of Snorri Sturluson. He died in uh, 1241 uh, after having become enemy with the king of Norway. He wrote this particular story about a Viking that uh, lived some 250 years earlier. So uh, it was more or less based on stories that he had been told by his probably by his grandmother, who got the story from her grandmother. There were six generations between these two men, but he was a descendant of these. We also have a picture of him in his short uh, A third person in the story, uh, we don't have a picture of him, but we think he looks like this guy here. He was a king of Norway, and he was just like our, our guy, Mr. Egid, he was uh, ill-tempered and greedy and strong, uh, but he was not excessively clever. Uh, this guy was clever. Uh, <laughs> so, um, <coughs> these sagas were all translated in the 19th century. It was, was a big romantic wave in Europe. We need to dig up the treasures of, uh, of the past times and, and uh, every second professor in Germany and England they, they were busy translating these sagas. And this, this is one of the translations from the uh, late 19th century uh, <coughs> and it tells about when Egid is collecting some money in Norway that he considered to be his. Now <coughs> In the night, the weather was calm, and the fell wind blew by night, and the sea breeze by day. So he obviously knows the circulation. Uh, one evening, Aegil sailed out, sailed out to sea, but the fishermen were roaming to the land. Um, <coughs> they, had set, they had set spies on Aegil's movements. This is a part of a complicated history. The king is chasing him uh, because uh, he, he had... Uh, he, he didn't show correct manners when he was collecting the money. And uh, the king wanted the money for himself. Now, uh, <clears throat> they had this to tell that Aegis had put out and sailed to sea and was gone. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the rest of this text, but let's uh, stop here and think about this word here, the fell wind. It's uh, in Icelandic, in the original as use of this document is called Fjallswinter, uh, which means mountain wind, or we call it Fjallswinter. So, uh, uh, 
I like to distinguish between these two features. We have catabatic flow coming down the slopes. Uh, there's a component of the gravity force pulling the flow down the slope, while the land breeze does not have a component parallel to the uh, gravity force. It is uh, entirely set up by pressure differences between uh, land and sea. And uh, at least the impression I have is that you need a little bit more for cooling to set up a land breeze than to set up some but uh, uh, some feeling is not enough, and we want to, to find out who is correct, like the Norwegian Weather Service or this old document. And we simulate the thermally driven flows. We simulate the flows over Iceland, which is the same latitude as, as in Norway, uh, similar mountains. And uh, we simulate both in a region where the land is flat and where the land is mountainous. This is the north coast of Iceland. This is a scale of 50 kilometers. We have high mountains, peaks up to 1,500 meters. And uh, we start the simulation at rest. And uh, during the night, we get outflow from the fjords. And we reach about 4 meters per second. It's not excessive, but there is. It's a swing coming up from that. So we want to know if it's because of the mountain or just cooling over the land. And so we consequently remove the mountains and we don't get any winds when the mountains are gone. So this is quite obviously a mountain generated wind. This is not a land breeze, it's a mountain wind. We continue, we move into December because we des desperately want to get some land breeze. And only in the middle of the winter, we manage to squeeze a little bit of land breeze when the temperatures here over land are minus 20, and this is open sea. Then we manage to get two weeks per second maximum. In the upper simulation, there are components of glacier wind associated with it as well? Or no, the glaciers are no glaciers. far away. They're far away, yes. So, but they are very, they're very nice. They give very nice catabatic winds in the daytime. And then they destroy their flights. I thought it was a good answer. Now, how did this guy know about the land, uh, about the catabatic winds? First of all, if you know that this was uh, a prevailing wind, he would be most of our prevailing winds, but how did he know that it came from the mountains, not land breeze? Um, <coughs> to understand that, and, uh, <coughs> and to understand one of the take-home messages that I will come back to in 20, 30 minutes, we should keep in mind that in these days, um, people have many roles. If you were a scholar, you basically were an expert on everything. He was a historian, he was a politician, businessman, poet, architect, teacher, everything you name it. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean that he had ten times more time than we did. It was more of an attitude. It was shameful <coughs> not to work. Know everything. Now, Snorri <clears throat> was raised in this place. It's completely flat. And during the night time, if there are no lows and synoptic scale flow, it's completely calm. He had business up in the north. That's where you get the catabatic winds during the night. So, my idea is that this is maybe the reason why he knew. That these things were talking about winds and not land breezes. Uh, <coughs> let's continue with the story. Uh, it's more of a social interpretation now, partly. Um, <coughs> the spies, they had this to tell that Egil had put out and sailed to sea and he was gone. 
This news they carried to Ben Vernon, the king's man. And when he knew these the tidings, these news, then he sent away all those men that he had before for protection. And thereafter he rode into Albrechtstadt. Uh, Albrechtstadt is, uh, is the farm where Bergen is now. And bade Frodi to his house, for he had a great aid making there. Frodi went with him, taking some men. And they were feasted well there, and they made merry with no fear of danger. And there, there too was no lack of drink. They had uh, uh, they had a way of making alcohol from from barley, and to some extent from honey that they got from the south. Uh, <laughs> that's mostly fermented barley. It was it, it was rather costly to do. It was the price of alcohol was relatively high, just as it is now. Now, what do you think that the cataphatic flows are going to bring? The enemy of the king. He was gone with the cataphatic flows, say that sea, and our simulation shows that the flow extends like 20 kilometers away from the coast. Of the uh, so these guys obviously thought that he was gone, going to Iceland. Catapatic flow springs into Iceland or England or somewhere else. So uh, of course he he couldn't get any further than a few kilometers away. Uh, <coughs> and when morning came, the wind fell and there was a calm. It's a complete description of the, of the circulation. Uh, there they lay drifting letting the ship ride free for some nights. And then when a sea breeze came on, Egid said to the ship, then we will uh, save the land. <laughs> and uh, he did. He, uh, and there was a big fight. Uh, <coughs> and uh, he ended his visit to Norway by, by raising this pole, which is a very interesting Thing. It doesn't really have to be much, but it has no connection with neutrometrology, but I, I like to mention it nevertheless, because <coughs> this uh, was a curse. So it's, a, it's a head of a head horse. So if you set some wood tree and you point at the, the, the head towards the land, um, the king was bound to lose his kingdom very soon. And, uh, in these years, this this works pretty pretty much the same as the banking system works today. If sufficiently many people believe that things are going to go wrong, and a lot of people believed in this, then they went wrong, and uh, the king lost his kingdom very very soon after that. <coughs> he actually met Aegis again in, in England, and they had to. Uh, uh, he had to write a poem to uh, escape the black time. So uh, <clears throat> the first conclusion is that, that these guys uh, <coughs> sitting in a monastery in, uh, in Iceland in the 13th century, they had a very clear picture of uh, the thermally driven circulations. They knew that uh, the land breeze wasn't land breeze but catabatic wind. And, uh, and you should... Uh, not rely on people that are ignorant of mythology if you want to keep, keep your kingdom. Now, <clears throat> a second part of what I want to tell you is about the downstroke flow. Down I've written a few papers on downstroke flow, uh, <clears throat> and uh, some of them are not very much referred to. Okay. Feel free to refer to them if, if you like and read them. Uh, I desperately once uh, um, um, <coughs> invented the name uh, um, Icelandic version of Bora, hoping that this would gain the interests of someone. Remains to be seen. <coughs> A warm version of the Bora, I think I did. Now, <coughs> nothing is new under the sun. 
And we think that we uh, were the first to describe the dark storm with storms, but it's not the case. There is a description in this particular manuscript of the five, written by Olavur Thorvarsson, who was a distant relative of the guy we just talked about. Now, uh, <coughs> this is an advertisement. Uh, I, I put it here to show you where the story takes place in the rest of the journals, the way the television <laughs> the information is here. This is this is rest. We have a mast, we have a big mast, tall mast, and we are trying to put the instruments on. It takes a terribly long time because they, they break down and then they put new instruments and they break down again. Uh, but we have some some data already from the lowest part that we have. If you want to come along and help us and get some interesting data, we're very happy to have you on the team. Now, uh, this is the mast. This is the place where a ship sank around the year 1000, just before the year 1000. It was before Christianity came to Iceland. Uh, <coughs> this is the coast, as it looks like in these days. Uh, this is where the ships sank and we have a mountain range here with peaks up to well, this about 1,000 meters. So, there is a story of a man that sails along the coast and uh, <coughs> the story is, uh, is told because the ship sank. The ship sank and uh, uh, the, there were complicated legal aspects on the inheritance. There were some wealthy persons on the ship. And uh, those that were writing the sagas, they always they desperately needed more skin to write on. The skin was very, very expensive. They didn't have any paper at that time. They, they, they only had skin from cars. And books were extremely expensive, and they always needed markets. They didn't get more money. And Iceland was a small country that didn't have much money. The only way was kind of going somewhere else and get it <laughs> somehow. It is a long tradition. Now, the, uh, that's the reason why the guy tells about this story, because 200 years earlier, there was a lot of men who really understood. So, <clears throat> they is sailing along the, the coast, and the weather being squally with high wind when the squalls broke over, but with winds between wise. To me, this is a description of a convective thing. You have winds, the, the precipitation comes, and you have strong winds, gusty winds, just like we had in, in the summer here, and then uh, <coughs> with little winds in between, the wind shuts. Okay, it didn't, it didn't cross my interest. I actually didn't read this text before I read the original version. But uh, in uh, 1903, another person translated this text. And now the text is different. It says, the weather was showery and the wind was strong when it blew clear, but blew little in between lines. So, it was calm when we had the rain, but when there was a clearing, it blew like hell. It's very, very different from uh, we, we we kind of have two two versions here. One is convective precipitation associated with poor winds, another one is strong winds during a clearing with some precipitation in between. Uh, <clears throat> Knowing the region and knowing that we don't really have any convection of this kind in the summer, it brings a lot of wind. It's only in the winter that we have much strong wind shear. Uh, the typical convective showers in the summer are more like this like thing. Uh, but in this region, we have downstream wind storms very, very few, or downstream acceleration. So if we have a stable, stably stratified flow, uh, an old occluded front, 
uh, with intermittent rain, <laughs> this is exactly the, the kind of weather we have. We have some clearings in between when downslope flow comes, there's a downdraft, and then in between we have weaker winds, and then the rain gets more easily across the mountain and, and some of the winds. Well, we don't need to. Uh, we don't need to go into this. We need to find out which is which is correct. We go into the original text that this document here is written in Icelandic, and it says very clear that, uh, as you see, <laughs> the, um, the it was calm when the rain was falling, and when you could see the clear skies, it was blowing like hell. So. I, we did a simulation of this. We didn't need this because it's a famous place for, for downstroke wind storms and, and uh, we get downstroke acceleration more or less all the time. So we have stably stratified flow with st stable flow somewhere close to the mountain top. So it's usually stable over there. And we had uh, this ship. Going down in a very, very similar wind storm in 1953, which is one of the two, two things to simulate that. <coughs> so, we have a, a description of a downslope wind storm from the 13th century, and we have the resource field family, German circulations, and from now on, we are coming to the third part of talk. <laughs> and uh, this is supposed to explain a bit social sciences, how mythology helped to find America, and, uh, and how back of the philosophical knowledge helped in that story as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to go back to one of these sagas I, I just mentioned, because <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting things there. Mm. This text is a little bit lengthy, but uh, we'll, we'll, need to, we'll really need to read it nevertheless. Olaf and his men got on board and sailed out to sea. They sailed close to Ireland. They came in for unfavorable weather through the summer. They had hogs plentiful. They had little wind, and what there was unfavorable and wide about the main, they drifted, and on most on board fell sea bewilderment. They got lost at sea. But at last, the fog lifted overhead, and the wind rose, and they put up sail. Then they began to discuss in which direction Ireland was to be sought. And they did not agree. Uh, the steering guy said one thing, and most of the men went against it. And uh, was a clever man, he was steering the boat. And he said that, and they said that, uh, was lost. Uh, <clears throat> they should rule who were, were greater than that. They wanted a referendum. <laughs> then Olaf. Olaf was the guy who owned the ship. He was not the steering guy. He, uh, he was asked to decide. He said, I think we should follow the counsel of the wisest. For the counsels of foolish men, I think, will be of all the worst service for us in the greater number. They get together. So he preferred the counsel of a wise person instead of the uh, outcome of a referendum where uh, all the stupid guys. <laughs> this is very, this is not very politically correct, uh, <coughs> uh, but of course it raises questions on democracy, and it reminds us that uh, uh, in these days democracy wasn't really the thing. Certainly, I'm not going to So, uh, 
I couldn't stop thinking about this when I was, I was walking across the square downtown and I, I saw some signs. There was a, an elderly person there. There was a sign asking for referendum. I don't know the content of this request. So, <clears throat> so this raises the question, what do you do when you're lost at sea? <laughs> and how did this clever guy got his information from? And more specifically, how did these guys find their way across the ocean? How did they find their way to America, back, and back to America, and back and the several times? They were obviously pretty sure of the results. Now, <clears throat> this brings us back to, uh, to this picture here. In these days, you, you had to be an expert in everything. Nowadays, we are experts in meteorology. You we know, maybe a little bit in that, in the documents or, or a little bit of a book or something. But there's a very, very strong tendency that people are sort of isolated in their box of expertise. And uh, when you ask the people that are experts in reading these documents, alleged experts, you get these answers here. Uh, I, I, I copied this from a paper. I don't want to make, make fun of the person who wrote the paper. That's the reason why I don't know if this is what I'll try to do. I'll try to be modest. Um, they, the, the, the Vikings used a number of navigational aids, including using special sundials. They used the stars and migration paths of birds, waves, coastlines, distant clouds of right islands, and so on. Uh, <coughs> to take the stars first, we have to think about that we know is a fact that they always chose the shortest possible distance from shore to shore. If they wanted to, to go to Iceland, they, they would go like either, either like this to the Faroe Islands and continue over here. If they wanted to go to Norway, to doing well, they, they just followed the shore as long as, as far as they could. Shortest possible distance across the ocean. They would not go to Greenland from here. And then we would certainly not go to America like that. And uh, they were sailing May, June, typically. In, in July, there was harvest. And in August, dark nights, stars came along. And uh, in September, we had storms. So uh, they, they were, there are no stars to be seen in this region. And they were sailing. The stars did not help. This is how the sky looks like in June. Birds are flying in April and May, and then they be turned in September. They are having eggs when the Vikings are saying that they're not flying. Waves is a pretty thing. Waves, they, uh, it's, it's kind of nice. I, I also laughed when I, when I read this. They have some breathing grounds. They, they have places where they prefer to stay. But uh, if you see a wave, you, you don't know the directions. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. If you see the coastline, of course, then it's <laughs> not so nice, especially if you recognize the world. Uh, I've been trying to work this out for quite a while. This can cloud so bright. Where I live, I have some, I have the peninsula about 100 kilometers away. And uh, uh, I've been trying to look at the peninsula for many years to see if the clouds over the peninsula could help me, telling me that there's land over there. And 
it has never happened. Uh, you, you don't see these uh, uh, winds, the Alto Cumulus Lenticularis, you don't recognize their shape at great distances. So they just white. You need to be rather close. And if you're rather close, you see the islands. <laughs> Uh, and the same really accounts for if you, if you see some towering cumulus, this must be warm, a warm island, then the visibility is, is very good. And if the visibility is very good, you see the sun. You know, <coughs> so this is not really helping us. And uh, this is really the thing. That's the thing. <coughs> There's been some research on the sunstone. Uh, that's a uh, um, stone called the Icelandic Spar that uh, allegedly takes, uh, <coughs> shows you where the sun is, even if there's a, a thin layer of clouds. The thing is that if you have a thin layer of clouds, you, you will always be able to detect the sun within a period of hours. And they, they had watched, they only needed the sun for maybe a couple of minutes. Find the latitude. All right. So what I'm getting to is this document here. It was in 1240 uh, in a place close to Bergen, west coast of Norway. We don't know who wrote uh, the document. Not signed, uh, but it contains uh, some texts on on the national sciences and meteorology. And how you should, and how how you recognise air masses. It is rather poetic, uh, but if we take away the, the poetry, we end up with this: that the rain is associated with southeasterly winds, and the fog. A person dressed up in a woolen coat is associated with winds from the south, and rain showers associated with southwesterly winds. This is an abstract from the King's Mirror. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the gusty showers are, are more a winter thing, and you have a cold air outbreak, and you have extreme convection, then the wind is very gusty. Uh, the brightness is associated with the wake of Norway. And of course, it's cold in the winter, it's continental here. So, what we do is we take the Norwegian cyclone and air mass model, which by coincidence was discovered or, or, or presented by the Bergen School. Uh, this is basically a copy of what is already been described in this, this uh, document from 1340. The only difference is that we have lines in between the air masses. That according to the, the uh, society up in these times in the in the early mention of this Fox. The guys of the Bergen School were uh, uh, influenced by views from the Fox school. Now now the question is, is this the Solon thing? Is this the thing that they used to navigate across the ocean? Uh, we know that they could tell the time of the day. They had some watches, sand flowing flow through glasses. And we know that they could estimate the latitude from the height of the sun the sky. They did not need to have the sun in the sky up moon. And uh, we suspect that they could determine the wind direction from the clouds, the type of clouds. So uh, we set on an experiment. This time it's not an American experiment. It's a very old-fashioned synoptic thing. <laughs> uh, we imagine that we have a ship at uh, Stad, this part of Norway, and we want to sail our ship to rest. Uh, and we wait for easterly winds. And then we sail off, and then we have another ship next week. We wait for recently winds, and then we sail off. And uh, I had a total number of four ships in June sailing off like this. 
And these are the tracks of the ships. They all reach Iceland safely uh, um, uh, within less than five days. These are the tracks uh, that this is when, when one of these ships was caught in fog that was not directly in winds from the south. The captain considered got fog and considered that he was blowing he was going the fog was in the southeast or easterly winds here. So he turned too far to the south. But only in one day it cleared up and he was able to determine his latitude and he discovered that he had gone too far south. He could turn up back. <clears throat> so what about the northerly winds? In the summer, if you have northerly winds, you usually have some sun, at least for a part of the day, and you can establish a direction from that. But, so, so this is how they, they, there was an active commerce in the, in the, in the entire region here, in the, in the 800s, in the 900s. Um, but they, will, they always wanted more. Uh, Norway was filled up with people in, in, the, in the 700s, and Iceland was getting kind of crowded. Uh, so uh, they wanted more. Um, and there was a person that, well, some guys discovered Greenland, that there were settlements over here in at the west coast of Greenland. And there was a merchant uh, living here that. Uh, to say it's Greenland. And he obviously uh, knew these rules that had brought him safely between Iceland and Norway. So he set off. But there are there are meteorological differences. Here the sea is, is very, very cold. And we also have uh, a big barrier. We basically never have southeast winds here because of barrier of, of, of it's always it always turns like this. So uh, when we have southerly winds or humid winds coming up here like this, they tend to turn to the northeast when we get here. Well, these guys didn't know that. <laughs> they had never ever experienced fog in winds from the northeast anywhere to this region. So what this guy did, he sailed off in easterly winds and then he got into fog. And his rule of thumb was you keep the winds to your left and you continue. So he kept the wind to his left side, the wind was blowing from the north to the east with fog, or he turned. He thought he was, he was sailing west, but in reality he was sailing to the south. He sailed far, far to the south, and then the fog lifted. He could establish the altitude, uh, but to be safe, he, he knew that if he, if he continued to the west, he would eventually meet wind. So he continued to the west. And uh, eventually, that's something else. He could, here, he could establish the altitude and, and he could go upwards north along the coast until he reached an altitude of the settlements of Greenland, uh, whereby he returned. He was a peaceful merchant. He told the stories of, of this land to the people of Greenland that had emigrated from Iceland. And they all went over there to, to uh, get, mostly to get trees. <clears throat> this is, of course, uh, a general conclusion of what I have. But I have another conclusion which I want to, to highlight. There's an example from last week. Uh, there is a certain value of having a society that works like this. Uh, if everyone knows a little bit, at least a little bit about everything, then uh, the risk of, of, of running into 
big mistakes. This is much smaller than otherwise. And uh, I'll give you an example here. This is a this is a, a setting a new plan constructions in the city up in the north, where it's been constructed by a group of architects, uh, um, and it's been approved by a group of politicians. And uh, uh, they issued a statement on these houses, and the statement says that uh, there will be green roofs on all of these houses, because uh, the green roofs, they are going to help prevent global warming. And you go to the sea, and of course, if you bring up global warming, the sea is not the houses. Um, nice thought, but uh, when we do the calculations, we find very quickly that uh, the consumption of fuel that is needed to bring all the soil from outside the city to the roof uh, <coughs> will create more. CO2 than the roof will be able to get back in, uh, in the best possible conditions in, in the first five years of the existence of the roof. But in reality, of course, all the water will be drained out. It's not going to. The roof is not going to be CO2 positive for the next 100 years. But nobody made the calculations to do this. Maybe because they have experts on this. Thanks. Thank you, Harold, for a very lively and still timely presentation. And uh, please go ahead with questions, comments, other thoughts. It's great silence. <laughs> In your second part of the talk, when you look for your second explanation for this uh, exchange of uh, high and low wind speeds, do you imply also existence of pulsations there, or, or that's far-fetched? We don't have it. We, it's not documented clearly. Uh, there are pulsations, yes. But uh, there were definitely pulsations from this ship. Sank the observations from 1953. This one. It actually sank in the harbor of the coast. Now, we don't have the pulsations. I'm not sure if the pulsations are essential. To sink a ship, you need at least uh, some time. So, well, yes. Thanks again for stopping by. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.